right, well, let's get started here. And as more people pile in, we will let them in. So welcome everybody to the, where are we, March? Yes, March, uh, Premier Pro User Group. Um, DJ is not here tonight. You get me by myself. So it's the Eric Show. We're going to air all our grievances about DJ since he's not here. Um, no, I take that back. We all love DJ. Um, so yeah, I'm not even sure what he's doing tonight. I think he, he had some kind of family thing, which is a pretty weak excuse seeing how today is my kid's birthday and I'm here. Just saying, no, no, DJ had a really good excuse. And I did a bunch of stuff with my kids this morning and before this meeting. So I did my daddy. So just so everybody knows, I'm not a horrible parent. Um, but um, I'm just going to go ahead and get things started here. We don't really have any announcements. Um, NAB is next month. I don't know how many people are interested in going to NAB. I am definitely going to go. I know our presenter tonight, Jeff Greenberg, is going to be there as well. So, but yeah, NAB is, I think it's the uh, exhibits are what, the 25th through the 28th, I think, of April? Uh, well, it's funny you ask. Why don't I just do this? Oh, I'll just put it up behind me. Go. Yeah, it's April 21st through the 27th. I don't know what that means, the 21st. So I actually have to bring up a calendar. Um, I mean, it's, it says a seven day event, but that really means like, the, all the uh, yeah, I think the, yeah. So Sunday is when they actually open up the show floor. Right. Does that sound right. Yes. That, because that's, they don't usually do it. So this is the first year they've done it like on a Sunday. It's usually Monday that they open it up Monday through Thursday, they right. Monday through Wednesday. So I'm sorry. Yeah. So they're opening up Sunday, but like the 22nd is when some of the early education, some of the side conferences start. Right. And I think Sunday, the 24th is the first actual day and it goes through to Wednesday, the 27th. Yep. And it's smaller. If you've never done it, go to NAB site, sort of like I have up here, click on the sponsorship and you can actually see who is got space on the show floor and where they are and it gives you an idea of what they're doing there if if you've never been you know for those of us who are in san diego i know we have a bigger audience outside of san diego but if you're in california or the west coast in general really you know if you've never been it's i the first couple of years i did it i did it in a day like i would fly out in the morning you do the southwest early morning flight fly into vegas i mean it's what an hour flight from san diego fly in spend the day and then fly back at night you know, have an idea of what you want to see, but it's actually a really fun, cool day. If you can do two days and spend the night, that's even better because there's a lot of activities at night, things that you can do. But um, if you're a video professional, it's really a fun thing to do, fun stuff to see, and you get to meet and hang with really cool people. Um, so yeah, I would definitely recommend NAB. And there's a ton of free passes to go right now. If you need a free pass, let me know um, and I will send you a code. I get a bunch of emails with free codes from all these different vendors. And so I will happily pass one of them along to you so you can attend for free. You're on your own for the plane ticket, but I'll help you get into the actual show for free. Um, so with that, I don't think I have any other announcements. So I meant to have Jeff Greenberg's uh, bio in front of me, but uh, yeah, don't, don't, don't do it. Don't do it. It's so not <laughs> worth doing like, but cause at the end of the day, it doesn't make a difference what my damn bio is these next five minutes are whether I prove to you that I have some semblance of the ability to speak in front of an audience and talk in a cogent way about compression without it being about numbers. And I'm not gonna be talking about numbers. While I'm sitting back and while, let me put my slide up behind me here. Um, I'm just gonna run a couple things at you. Normally I would run a poll, but there's no reason to do that. We've got chat here and I've got it up in front of me. While we're sitting here, while I do the first minute or two here, do me a favor. In the chat, tell me what your biggest headache is around compression. Because I just want to see if I've correctly anticipated it. I probably have. Um, I'm, while we're doing that, I'm going to put into the chat, I'm going to put in my email. That's my email. I'm jeff at jgreenbergconsulting.com. Um, if you want my website and the like, let me do this, because uh, I have this at the end. Uh, right there. This is, um, oh, that's, that's neat. Oh, I see why, because it's from the extra stuff. We don't need that either. This here in the chat, if you want this presentation, I'll publish this. I'll, by the way, I'll publish this presentation anyway. I'll get you guys a link. I'll get it to Eric. But just so you're aware, um, I have a mailing list. 
I managed to send out one email last year. It was that I was speaking at Adobe Max. I didn't even do the, hey, I'm going to be doing these virtual presentations. Um, I've done all that stuff. I'll give you my phone number at the end. Emails are free. Phone calls cost money, just so we're all agreed. I see manageable size. I see quality. All those things are brilliant. Don't hesitate to ask questions. I can roll with it as we go. I want to come out of the gate, come out of the gate strong. I want you to know, here's what I'm doing tonight. I'm going to do a cool tip. I'm going to do the best choice for export. I'm going to talk about how to make video look better and keeping the file size manageable, as well as how to export faster. I'm not going to spend any of your money whatsoever beyond what we all spend for Creative Cloud subscriptions. Um, I should have you put in whether you're Mac or PC centric, but I don't care because I'll cover both. I want to show you the slide that's our nightmare with compression with my cool tip out of the way. Too many options. I love that, Farah. Right there. How many of us fear this slide? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, in Media Encoder, which Premiere uses for all of its exports, even if you say export in Premiere, there's a switch that says don't encode outputs when missing items are detected. Um, I'm going to do a screen share because I just want you to see that. I'll be bopping in and out of screen share. I don't want to live entirely in screen share just because we're so zoomed out as human beings. Um, but here's my screen share. Here's Media Encoder. I've made it nice and bright so it's easy to see. Uh, and I'm going to say open up my preferences. And right here under general, there's a switch here that says don't encode outputs when missing items are detected. With that on, if I've got a frame that's offline, it won't encode. By the way, there's another great switch here called Start Queue Automatically when idle for two minutes. And I'll often work, queue something up in the background while I continue to work and just have it chew away, knowing that it's going to pause when I'm doing playback in Premiere. So I've shown you that. I'm going to drop out of the screen share. You know, bring me back to my presentation. Okay. I got one other really crazy tip, and it's just too good not to show you, which is everything I'm going to show you inside of Media Encoder, you can actually test something before you go to encode it by making it an out mark. And here's the generalized rule. You could make a 30-second difficult section, high motion, lots of dissolves, that 30 seconds is a great representative half minute for figuring out what things will look like at a given data rate. This little switch here, this little in and out cost me blood. Um, 20 so years ago, I was tasked on a Friday under OS 9. For those of you who go back with computers that far, uh, I ended up doing some encoding and wanted to try different bit rates. And it would take three or four hours for each one I did. And I had 10 of them queued up. It was going to take 35 hours. It was a Friday, luckily. I hit encode. I came in on Sunday morning, and it worked. It didn't crash. And then I discovered I could have made an in and out and done the whole thing in about 30 minutes. And I cried. I cried. You should know that Media Encoder allows you to do in and out marks. I'm just going to show you that. Again, we're going to go ahead here. We'll do my screen. Here's Media Encoder. Oh, I need a piece of footage in there. I got a big, chunky piece of footage. This is a two gigabyte file. And I'm just going to dump that into Media Encoder. I don't care what, what it's going to bring me up as. I'm going to go ahead, click. I'd like you to see right here, I, O. You can mark an in and out mark. You can do it from Premiere. When you do it from Premiere, you get the choice down here for entire clip or custom, same way. And when you go to encode, it's a great way for you to check part of your footage to see how it encodes. All right. Uh, let's come back to my slides. Let me stop that share. Talked about in and out marks. And again, I'd rather have you engaged. I will give you this entire slide deck when I'm done. <clears throat> I have rules about compression. I actually went through and thought this out. Um, we're going to cover about three or four of these rules, like um, VBR over CBR, about 
uh, containers and codecs, but I've thought too far. I'm an editor's editor. I can talk to you about Premiere. I can show you the coolest tricks on the timeline. I teach compression because people avoid teaching it because it's, it's like, it, it's important you eat broccoli. It's important you know about compression. Same generalized concepts. So how can I export faster? For my five gorgeous people, six who are on camera, how many people wanna know how to export faster? Oh, I love you people. For those of you who have your camera off, you're giving me a blank wall. It hurts, it hurts. So the first thing I wanna show you, Ahmed, that's good. Uh, first thing I wanna show you is that you should use your previews in Premiere. Uh, and you can do this on export and throw the switch that says use previews. And the beautiful part about this is as you're editing, every time you go to check some email, every time you go to take a bio break, grab some coffee, you could just say, take a section and render it. And yep, it's gonna build up a lot of render files. But when you throw the switch, Premiere won't have to do the calculation math of your After Effects pieces, of your, uh, of your MoGarts, of all those things, of your keying, because you've been building these as we go. But the default for previews, frankly, sucks. Sucks is a good technical term. Oh, here's, there's a switch you need to map. You should remap render selection. Render selection actually says render everything, not just the yellow effects. I hope you know at this point, yellow means got, has some GPU existence from the Mercury playback engine. Red means it's all CPU based. Not that it won't play back, but it's all CPU based. I like to render every little piece of item, but I need to not have it do the default, which is render as an MPEG-2 file. I want to change this to Cineform, DNX, or ProRes. Let me make this nice and big. Let's get Jeff out of the way. I personally do most of this stuff to ProRes 422, but you could just as equally uh, do DNX. I would do DNX uh, usually, DNX what? Um, probably, HQX, if it's a 10-bit co codec, maybe just HQ if it's not, or Cineform. Uh, and the whole reason here, the whole rationale is I'm doing it in mezzanine, a post-production codec, and it's going to have an extra benefit in a moment. But I got to get it out of the crappy MPEG-2 codec that they use by default. Why did Adobe do that? Adobe did it because they were trying to get the fastest preview. That's why it's a preview and not a render. So with this switch thrown and with the preview switch, we'll get super crazy fast exports out of Premiere. So again, it's that idea that we want to use our previews and render as we go. One other step to go faster. If you've rendered all those pieces into ProRes and you export to ProRes, Premiere doesn't recompress everything. Premiere treats it as a file copy. And this is kind of a wild concept. Don't take my word for it. You should test it. By the way, treat me as if I'm a liar. Don't trust anything I'm doing. You should prove everything I'm doing for yourself. Again, you can email me. I'll give you this whole deck. You're recording it so you can look back at it later. But this is the concept. If I've rendered as ProRes and I export as ProRes, Premiere goes, oh, this is smart. I won't recompress this again. I will just output it to the file. You're technically speaking, offloading your render time by making it during slow time. I'm getting a drink of water. I'm, I'm eating lunch. I got to make that phone call. So when you go to do that final export, all it's doing is a file copy. This smart Rendering codec, by the way, you don't have to check. ProRes, MOV, automatically. Uh, DNX, Cineform, all those automatically. I had to tell Premiere to be under XD cam. And for my six, seven people here now with the camera on, thank you, Andy. Um,
for the seven people here, I'll let you know if you knew what XD Cam was, if you were doing XD Cam exports specifically. This is where that came about was the idea that you shouldn't recompress stuff that was already compressed the right way. Um, so this, the idea is if you were a camera and your output, this is an old, old school thing. If you were using mini DV and exporting the mini DV and you did just made cuts, all the software would do is do a file copy. It would just copy between your edits. Smart rendering codec is built in and hidden in a lot of ways. Um, when you render, normally it's a re-encode. ProRes does this, ABC intra frame. What doesn't do it, Jeff? H264, HVEC, HEVC, um, a couple of the other codecs. And the idea might be for the fastest post-production workflow, you might use an Atomos to capture your footage in ProRes. You might render into ProRes. You'd output into ProRes. And man, your system will be going as fast as it can go. Um, and that's using Adobe Media Encoder. The last thing about speed I want to talk about is this. It is crucial, crucial, crucial when you go to export that you have this tiny switch for um, hardware-based encoding. And if, oh, you can't see it because my head's in the way. Move me over. There we go. Go big. Go on the other side of the screen, Greenberg. Go full screen. There it is. Right there. Hardware-based encoding. When you go and you do two-pass VBR, you'll never get hardware-based encoding. If you're doing H.264 material. Hi, Noel. You, you came on with your audio. Oh, he's in. He's out. He's in. He's out. <laughs> it's not that it, I'm always excellent. It's a lie, I believe. I'm not denigrating the value of two-pass VBR, but that's when our biggest focus was trying to make stuff super crazy small. I have a super crazy small technique. It's not something that is immediately available directly in Media Encoder. I'll use another tool. And look, I got Larry's face too. No, did you have a question? Because I see you've got your mic live. No, I didn't have a question. Would you like me to uh, remute it? I just wanted to, I, you could listen, brother, you can have it live. It's okay. I'm just don't want stray sounds. You know what I mean? Sure. Sorry. I think somebody, no, no, it's okay, man. I think somebody's got a question. It's the nature of presentations. Won't knock me off my game. Um, okay. So putting myself back, there we go. Hardware based encoding. If hardware based encoding is not there for you, it's time to upgrade your machine. And you're going to find this is something that's specific to H.264 and HEVC, this hardware encoding switch. And for you real technical geeks, did you see the eyes close as I had to dig into the brain? It's 9.30, it's 9.53, it's past my bedtime. If you have an AMD Ryzen, the AMD chips, I believe don't have access to uh, hardware encoding, but I might be wrong. I might be wrong on that. I'm 99% sure, but I'm not 100%. I have a Ryzen box somewhere. Um, okay, that's faster. What's the best choice for my export? Glad you asked. This brings us into a story about codecs and containers. And this is a spot where you may not be confused, but your clients often get confused. Um, I'm a big fan of this free tool called Media Info. Why do I like Media Info? Media Info allows me to look inside of a file and see exactly its data rate and how it was encoded. It doesn't say VBR, but it gives me loads of information. I'm gonna demo it for you right now. Uh, it's a dollar uh, on, the I on the Apple store. It's free on the Windows store, but you can go directly to their site. I'm gonna share part of my screen. I've got a file here. I'm going to launch Media Encoder, I'm sorry, Media Info. And I also am going to need one other file for this. So of course it came up on the wrong screen. There we go. And I'm just going to take this, drag it over. Hey, look, this is a ProRes file, 422. Its bit rate is 466 megabits per second. You don't have to know what that means. You just need to know that it was a number that it used. I'm just going to look here for on my system quickly for a piece of video. Uh, there we go. I have no idea what this is. We're going to drag that over. This is an AVC 
file. That's H264. Um, this has got a much deeper look at this. When I click, you'll see that much deeper look here where we can see, for example, it's chroma sampling, subsampling, uh, it's actual, it's, it's bit rate. Wow, the bit rate's only 188 kilobits, it's super small. Uh, what its format is, this information is super crazy useful, but if it's beyond you today, that's okay. You should know again, you are totally welcome to like, if you had a question about this, email me about it. Media info is the magic decoder ring for looking in your media files. For those of you who used to use QuickTime and say, get info, it's a much, much better tool. For those of you who use VLC player and do it, no. Media info, by the way, they use the same engine underneath the hood. I think of compression. I think of these things as a bucket and liquid. A container holds a codec. And so um, QuickTime could hold H.264. MPEG-4 could hold H.264. AVI could hold H.264. You can buy different glasses and put excellent beer in any glass. Some glasses can't hold all liquids, though. If I'm pouring acid into a styrofoam cup, I'm in trouble. And that's the kind of the concept. So I just want you to see here that AVC H.264 could be an MPEG-4. So could HVEC, could be in an M4V, could be in an MKV. QuickTime, ProRes can, can go in QuickTime and MXF, the material exchange format. QuickTime cannot go into the MPEG-4 container. Um, these are all different examples of container and codec. I separate them. I'm very, very specific about separating them because clients will say to me, I need an MOV and I'll go, hey, wait, what's supposed to be inside of there? Show me the spec sheet. And if you don't know, it's my job to educate you, the client. I often have to export media for a broadcast, says Frederico. And some clients ask for XDCAM 422 in an MOV something impossible to do in Windows. Ah, ah, don't hate clients. I have a present for you, Frederico. It's really for everybody. It's part of my talk anyway, brother, but I'll do it here. Um, I'm bringing up a piece of free software that I'll talk about in a little bit called Shutter Encoder, and Shutter Encoder will totally do this. I'm going to uh, just quickly do a screen share just so you can see this piece of software. Shutter Encoder, is a, another free piece of software. Here it is, Shutter Encoder. We're gonna use this anyway later. I'm gonna go ahead here and take my video. It's cross-platform. It is a GUI running on top of FFmpeg, and I can do crazy, crazy, crazy things. This list goes way beyond this. I could say, for example, I would like to do ProRes, but I would like to do it in a Actually, I don't know if I could put it into a, um, no, no, let's try that again, Greenberg. I would like to do, don't help me anybody. I'd like to do XDCAM 422. There it is. And I'd like to do it in an MOV container for Drico. And this is free software that's easier than the command line. Ahmed asks, I have a question, Jeff, when you get a chance, why VBR2 pass always use software encoding? Oh, that's because, Hardware encoding is meant to go fast, and two-pass requires more precise calculation, something that hardware encoding doesn't do. Um, just my general rule, I'm going to stop the screen share. My general rule about hardware encoding is we up the bit rate a little bit, and we up the bit rate because hardware encoding is less efficient than software encoding, but it's significantly faster. And I'd rather have the time to spend with my family and let the upload time be a little longer than I would uh, waiting for the tiniest file. There are exceptions to this. I worked with some people in the Middle East who needed to get files to the states where they were doing it over satellites. Then file size is a big thing, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, two general types of codecs we care about, and I want to differentiate this. Three, if you include camera masters. ProRes and DNX are what I consider mezzanine or post-production codecs. H.264 and HVEC are distribution formats. Hey, Jeff, what's the big difference between these? Well, you should know that the post-production or mezzanine codecs have fixed values. When you say, I want to do ProRes 422 or ProRes HQ, there's nothing you can change about it. The, 
the larger the frame rate, the larger the frame size, the larger the file, it's preset. But H.264, H.265 distribution codecs are a knob and you can change it. The knob is large or as small as you would like. Doesn't say it will look good. I can literally make a, a, a 8K file, super crazy tiny. It'll look, now this is a technical term, it'll look like shit when I make it really, really tiny. The real kicker here is how do I get it to look good? And I'm headed there, everybody. But I'd like you to hear these tools, this concept that we've just covered is basically this idea that we've got these adjustments. And I'd like you to hear the fact that I love Media Encoder, I love its workflow, and there are times where I will use it and use it in a watch folder or an automated way to automatically put stuff on YouTube or on Vimeo or other places. But when I'm trying to do hyper small, guaranteed high quality encoding, I'm using something other than Media Encoder on the Mac. On Windows, I'll use Media Encoder and I'll get a little ass assistance. Because the practical question is, how can I make my video look better and be small? And this gets us into this discussion about CBR, VBR, and more. And you see that big number seven? That's because it's the seventh rule of Greenberg's Golden Rules of Compression. I'd like to talk to you about constant bit rate and variable bit rate. And this is the part for those of you who self-identify and go, I'm not the best with numbers. I got you. It's basically, this all this stuff, this data rate stuff is about, it's how data is spent and it's exactly like money. And if we can agree for a moment that it takes $300 to eat for a month, here's an easy question, not hard math. How much does it cost per day. Now that's not March with 31 days. It's not uh, uh, February with 28. Let's do any month with 30 days. That's right. It's going to cost you $10 a day to eat. This of course is tremendously unrealistic in the bottom of 20, beginning of 2022 with all of the crazy inflation going on. But this idea, this, this idea that I'm spending the same amount of day, this is a constant amount of spending. And this is exactly the concept about what constant bit rate is. It gives the same amount to every frame. But realistically, this is how we work as fiscal conservatives with our wallet. We sit back and if we spend more money one day in Vegas, we spend $15, we know the next couple of days we got to back off. This could just as equally be eating. We have a really, really splurge big meal. We eat a lot of your favorite food. We know the next couple of days we got to head towards salad. This idea of $10 on an average, well, that is variable bit, very much amount of spending. This is CBR and VBR, constant data rate. Every frame gets the same amount, variable bit rates, they change around an average. It's a lot of information. You doing okay? Can I get some thumbs up? Right? You never thought a compression talk would hold your interest. Damn straight it will. Um, here's the kicker, kids. Below some level, it's difficult to survive. Now, look, if you're Bill Gates and you have $10,000 a month to spend on food, it's easy. But if you only have $240 a month or you have some unexpected uh, expenses, it becomes a lot harder. And you know what I'm going to tell you is you starve a little. And when you give a codec too little data, it starves and what you see is damage. So the goal is, is either that we th solve the problem by throwing more data at it, or we use another type of encoding. Just so we understand, constant bit rates work best with lots of data. Your camera codecs shoot mostly in, const in a constant bit rate. There are exceptions, this is an exception, your phones, your, your GoPros, your drones, they often are shooting a VBR, but a very aggressive B VBR. Um, CBR is fast, no analysis, post codex, ProRes, CBR. Variable bit rate is more flexible at the cost of time. You gotta do some thinking, just like we did with our, 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 our budget. You have to do a little bit, oh Christ, I spent too much money yesterday. I gotta be a little conservative today. You're using some of your brain power in analyzing. And hardware encoding helps. 
So the general rule is when you're making smaller files, VBR is better than CBR as you go smaller. And this is because of how compression works. And this idea of CBR, constant bit rate, as I said, every frame gets the same amount of data. And look, when you talk from uncompressed and you pick any codec, it's just sitting back and compressing it down. It's just like JPEG. It's spatial compression. And the more you push the knob over, the more spatially it gets compressed. Variable bit rates, though, as we said, they, they vary. And they do it by robbing Peter to pay Paul. And so this is, um, that's, uh, Eric, that is my firstborn. She is currently 10, one room over there. But she uh, here is about three. And when we talk about simple material like talking heads that don't change a lot versus the cherry blossoms in DC, we need to rob Peter to pay Paul. We could take the data from the parts that have very little motion and give them to the parts that have more motion under variable bit rate. And it does it by temporal compression. And temporal compression works like this. Here is, and this is legit, this is 10 frames, nine frames from a video I took of Sophie. And look at the first two frames. They are nearly identical. Now the first to the last, they change a bit. And what's going on, and I'm gonna make this full screen here. What's going on is the black pixels in the bottom represent the changes. There's very little data here. And that's the beauty of this as a concept, is that between any two frames, all I'm doing is sending the changes. This is also why H.264 and HVEC are very hard to edit, because your computer is caching 30 or more frames just for playback. You do a dissolve, 60 to 90 frames have to be cached just for playback to occur, and that makes the CPU hurt. Distribution codecs throw out a ton of information. That's why they're terrible to edit with. So types of data rates, just as a review, constant one-pass VBR, two-pass VBR. Which is fastest? Don't bother. Yeah, look, Charlene, is it Charlene? Charlene was answering. She was, I see her answering. She's muted. It's okay. You're right. Constant is the fastest. You're so on ball with this. Constant is the fastest. Two pass VBR is the slowest. Here comes a trick question, everybody. Which one builds the smallest files? That's the data rate. Whatever you set it to is builds the smallest files, not CBR or VBR. And so this is the real conceptual summary that we need to understand with media encoder. VBR is better than CBR some of the time. And if you believe in that good, fast, cheap paradigm, this is good, fast, small. CBR, you know, can I get a, I think I can get a pointer here. If I can't, I should be able to, I don't want big hand. Oh, that's right. It's under here. I'm supposed to know. Oh, there it is. Pointer. Oh, Oh, there we go. Oh, wait, my last name is Greenberg. So green is always the right answer. So you see, when I do fast and good, I do CBR, a high data rate. That is literally what your camera does. When I want good and small, I can do VBR one pass with a higher data rate. And if I want to pee, yeah. If I want it to be really small, that's when I go to pass, but it's gonna take a lot more time for it to stay good. Now, as kind of a funny, funny piece in here, I actually believe in fast, small, and bad looking. And just to wake you up, all watermark stuff, everything gets watermarked from me until they've paid their bills. If somebody is on partial payments and they haven't, if they've missed a payment, they don't get everything unwatermarked until they're, they're caught up. But I'll do CBR at a low data rate intentionally for it to be crunchy. So my client, and I'll say to them, this isn't the way it's going to finally look. It'll be much cleaner. But I'm doing that to keep them from having one that they just feel like they can throw up on YouTube and go, oh, this is good enough. Okay. Now, here comes the piece of religion that's been my last three or four years, five years of com compression. We talked about CBR, we talked about VBR. Well, guess what? There's something else. 
And that's something else. It's called constant quality or constant reference frame. So I want you to just take a moment and think this out. What if we could care about the quality instead of the data rate? In other words, yeah, I'd like it to be small, but I'm okay with it being a little bit bigger if you guarantee it's not going to be damaged. In fact, the very the third or fourth slide of my golden rules, rule number one is, um, God, I don't remember what the rule is. That's, that's uh, what slide are we on here? We're on slide 64, 64 slides so far, by the way. Here's, here they are, compress only once. I would like you to never, and, and by the way, number four there is garbage in, garbage out. If what comes out of media encoder is damaged, I guarantee you it'll be damaged on YouTube. I guarantee you, because they're all going to recompress everything you do anyway. What is really valuable here is that I could guarantee a file that's undamaged. And I'm going to do it in a second. I'm going to start doing some compression here in the background, because I'd like you to talk, talk about the fact, what if we could care about the quality instead of the data rate? Now, to really make this scary, I'm going to do, a, do my screen share again. I got shutter encoder loaded up. I got Shutter Encoder loaded up with a file, and I'd like you just to see that file here. This file is a two, it's nearly three gigabytes, and um, I, it's fairly short. It's a 4K file. It is 48 seconds. This only works because the source of this file is ProRes. This is a big file. So a minute here is about three gigabytes. I am going to compress this. I'm going to use shutter encoder for this. I'm going to make this an H.265 file. There's my VBR switch right here. Click, uh, let me see if I can do this. Pro cursor, pro mouse. Let's see if it does the job. Oh, it's just doing the job. Oh, thank God. See that little VBR right there? See it? I don't want VBR. Click. I don't want CBR. I want CQ, constant quality. I'm going to do a constant quality here of 28. I'm going to go down to advanced features. I'm going to explain this to you in a second. I'm going to say force preset. I could leave it at medium. I probably should. I'm going to set it to ultra fast. I'm going to do start the encode. So this is a minute of footage. It's going to take about two minutes to go. I'm going to hit start function, go. And I just want to wait for... Uh, the first second or two for this to come up. So this is going to take about a minute and a half. So this is a little slower than real time. The original file was approximately three gigabytes. We're going to come back in a minute. I'll let you guys guess about what the file size will be. I want to talk about constant reference frame, constant quality encoding. Constant quality encoding says, I want it to look good. I don't care if it's a little bit bigger or smaller. And there are free tools that do this. Uh, and we're going to look at a bunch of these tools, but um, Handbrake does it for those of you who are Handbrake fans. Uh, Vocoder, V O U K O D R E R, does it in Windows directly in Media Encoder and Premiere by using the X2, H.264 and XH265 engines. Handbrake does this, as I said, Shutter Encoder does this. Um, I believe I've got links for all of these. What's the drawback of this? is you don't know how the file size, how big it's going to be. Well, what dictates the file size? What dictates the file size is the speed of your compression. When you say ultra fast, it will be larger. When you say very slow, it'll be slower. How significant? Well, you saw ultra fast HVAC is nearly real time. Very slow might be 10 times real time. In theory, in theory, very slow, should be producing a file much, much, much smaller than UltraFest. Notice I said in theory, because I found a current bug in uh, the HVEC codec. When, when we get done here, we're almost encoded. Let's see if we're encoded yet. No, no, I don't want to, they're good. I don't want them to see how big it is. I want just to see, we, we've got six seconds. Before I go any further in the chat, how big do you think that three gigabyte file is going to be? And I'm going to tell you the quality is near to perfect. You just got to throw in a number, gigabytes, megabytes, whatever you want to do. I want to see what you guys put, 500 big gigabytes. All right, David, I'm proud of you for throwing a number in. I got to get three numbers before I'll show you. 
33 megabytes. Charlene, all right. I like that. 120 says for Drico. Uh, four, four megabytes. Jeff, I don't believe you. Yeah, I know. I'm opening up the file. That is a 4K file. It is gigantic on my screen. Uh, I'm going to arrow through just a little bit so we could see some artifacts. There are a little bit of crunchy. It's not, not bad. I'm going to go ahead here. I'm going to knock it down so it fits in our corner of the screen. I'm going to play it back. Uh, I'm going to take a moment and optimize Zoom for video playback. I'm going to play this back. This is 40 seconds of video at four megabytes. This footage, by the way, comes from Edit Stock. If you're not familiar with Edit Stock, they give you, they, they will sell you entire films to practice with. This is for color correction. This is all log material. The entire films, Edit Stock, uh, Misha Tenenbaum, they also have a thing called Edit Mentor. It's fantastic. This is four megabytes, M megabytes, three gigabytes down to four megabytes. HVAC encoding of 4K, it's still playing. You could email this. Yeah, you should be dropping S-bombs here. You thought an encoding, it's still going. I'm, I'm gonna let it run to the end. There's the end. Yeah, I know it's cool. Um, 4.3 megabytes. I didn't know I've never encoded that file before. Okay, so we'll talk more about this. I'm gonna take this off, to stop the screen share. I wanna come back here. Um, tools that do this. Handbrake does this. They all have the same set of tools. They all have two switches we care about, quality and speed. You pick your codec. Do you wanna go H.265, which we recommend for 4K? Just know that some of the mobile devices don't decode it so well, um, or H.264, and then it's speed and constant quality. Zero is lossless. 10 is where post codecs are. 20 looks really good. 51 is the other side. Anything above about 23, not so great. I encoded a 28 because I was aiming, it's a 4K file. I was aiming for the smallest file size. Um, when you get to 4K, you can exceed, you can go smaller than 23. You can go 24, 25, 26, 28. I knew ultra fast, there's a bug somewhere in there that ultra fast HVEC um, produces smaller, better looking files than all the other speed switches. So speaking about the speed switches, ultra fast, um, slow, it's a continuum, especially with H.264, the smaller you set it, the smaller the file will be. Uh, shutter Encoder, shutterencoder.com, uh, free tool, it's an excellent tool. Uh, here are the same switches, VBR to CBR to CQ, Medium is the default. Ultrafast is an excellent choice for HVAC. Vucooter is Windows only. It installs a gasket directly into Premiere and into um, Media Encoder. Uh, it allows direct access in Premiere to constant quality or Media Encoder. It also does other tools like Vegas, you know, for those of you who remember what Vegas was. Um, oh, that's my last real practical slide. I've got an extra 10 minutes here of refreshment. And I'm going to open it up for any question in the world. Uh, before I do, I'll just pimp myself a moment. My name is Jeff Greenberg. I'm a, a post-production professional. I spend a lot of my time helping make smart people smarter. I do direct education at groups. I work virtually with it. I work in person. I'm a master trainer. I teach train the trainer classes. I do it for Adobe. I do it for some of Adobe's competition. They like the way I teach over the fact that I might do work with other tools that have an A and a B in their name. I'm Jeff at J Greenberg Consulting. My mailing list is at bit.ly Greenberg Updates. Let me just throw that into chat again. Um, if you'd like to see more of my BS, I'm film geek pretty much everywhere, all those social networks. Uh, Twitter, which is how Eric found out about me, 
he said, uh, hey, does anybody teach compression well? And about four people threw my name. I do an eight-hour class at NEB a couple of years. Jeff, eight hours on compression? Yeah, well, it's a week's worth of compression class. I just get it down to eight hours or three hours or 45 minutes or so like we do here. Uh, there is my phone number. If you were to call it, it would not ring, but it, emails are free. Phone calls uh, cost money. I, uh, If you look back in last year's, I'm, I'm done with this BS. Uh, if you look at last year's um, Adobe Max, uh, this year's Adobe Max, I did a session on auto reframing work. If you look at last year's, I did a session on um, uh, a color, the color lab, and I give you footage and learn how to color correct in an intuitive way. And with that, I'm done my BS. I'm happy to answer anything, solve your problems. And if you're really desperate, I'll build you a preset if you wanted. So with that being said, my eight people who have their camera on have the highest priority. Is there anything I can answer? Do you need something in greater detail? Anything you feel I skirted, this is your chance. Uh, Jeff, this is Hi. awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, but this is a, not a question on Codex. It's okay. We, I, I teach other stuff. So, so, but it's about compressions and stuff. Uh, so yeah. my team does a lot of uh, transcoding, you know, production drives. And we're, we always have to keep track of the file, the root folder and the folder structure. The only software that I'm familiar with that we use that does that is DaVinci Resolve. Is there any other applications that? Absolutely. Absolutely there is. I got about three of them for you. Are you on Mac or are you on Windows? Mac. My best bet for you out of the gate is the one you've seen me use tonight. Here is Shutter Encoder. And I'd like you to see here is Preserve Folder Hierarchy right there. It's free. This is the FFmpeg. Resolve does a phenomenal job of something like that. It just has, uh, and, and it's, it's a favored tool of mine. I may... Surprising, mm -hmm. Dean, I'm a master instructor for Resolve as well. I'll teach you Fusion if you really want to learn Fusion. Mm -hmm. um, the I'm, I'm shitty at motion graphics, but I can teach you Fusion. I teach you how to do match moves in it. The, the real thing that, um, the thing that makes Resolve magical for me in a lot of cases is that it can be sub substituted in for some DIT uses. You should be aware that... Um, Brain, brain, uh, Palm Fort Silver Stack is another excellent, excellent DIT level, not cheap, but an excellent tool that does preserve folder hierarchies because they're built to rebuild transcodes. I mean, that's what what's the serious heavy level DITs are using, stuff from Palm Fort. Um, sh Shutter and Code, uh, uh, not Shutter and Code, Shotput Pro and Hedge do some of that, but I don't know off the top of my head. I think neither of them do direct compression work. The other thing that I'll mention out there are tools like Vantage from Telestream, but they're a hardware box. And you should be aware you can get a lot of that feature set on a Windows box that's similar. FFmpeg has a GUI version that's like a flow chart called FFA Trans, which is supposed to be F fast transcoding. And it does a whole bubble chart, but you got to devote a Windows box to it. And you're probably not going to want to take a Mac Mini and reformat it as a Windows system just for this one piece of software. So I would start with Shutter Encoder. I would uh, look to see how it, it, by the way, it does watch folders. The only thing that's a negative with it, um, I think DaVinci's color science is excellent, is excellent, especially if you're working with log-based material and you're building proxies and you want a really good color transform. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with using Resolve, except, except it doesn't have watch folder capabilities. Shutter does, and you can give it a lot, but just understand Resolve's color science is much cleaner, but my use of it would be proxy-based work, not transcodes as a substitution to retain log-based information. Wow. Wow, I can't believe that just came out of my mouth at 10.30 at night in my that, brain. That was worth How it. am I doing, Dean? Yeah. That was perfect. Actually, I'm, I'm pretty interested in Palm Ford Silver Stack, so I'm gonna, I'll am gonna look that up. You should go look at it. Um, yeah. It's yeah. like that's, that gets into a vert, like I, I've, so 
on the color correction side, you know, I can juggle a whole bunch of my, I can't really pick it up. I've got, I, well, I, I got a different grading surface over there. Here, here we go. Oh, oh. There you go. There's my little tangent ripple. You know, I've got a color grading monitor. The lights in here can change the right appropriate color temperature. I will tell you whether you use Resolve or whether you use uh, Lumetri or some of the great third-party tools out there like CinemaGrade. Having um, a set of wheels, this is like a two, $300 set. You're just so much faster. You're just so ridiculously much faster knowing that you have to do a color correction pass and you're going to spend a professional color spends about 90 seconds a shot. And so anything like that can help me out is a big boon to my life. Next up, great question, Dean. Next up, who, who else is going to feel free to ask follow-ups if you need it. Don't, don't get shy. Don't get shy on me. Okay, I'll, I'll ask one right now since while everybody's pondering their, their question here. And I already think I kind of know the answer to this, but a lot of people this comes up occasionally. So for the, and for those who are posting to YouTube, Vimeo, those kind of, those kind of places, what's the format, the, the codec container, whatever, you know, what, what would you recommend? You know, I've heard that I know, I think YouTube will accept ProRes. I don't know about Vimeo. Um, but what do you recommend if you, you know, to get the best quality, cause they're going to recompress everything. So it seems like going H.264 would probably not be the best option for quality. So we run into a, Bunch. I'm by the way, what you should know what I'm doing here. I'll I'll throw the browser up behind me. Um, I'm specifically behind me here, bringing up a couple pre-built links that I have that are super crazy valuable. Um, and I'm doing it specifically on YouTube. So let's do item number one here. Oh, come on, YouTube. Really? I get nothing. I got to do it that way. Deep breath. There we go. Advanced encoding. Uh, I want to do one more encoding you to help. So um, let's talk practical item one. They're all going to recompress. There's one group out there that doesn't. And this, by the way, is uh, all the groups, relatively speaking, are going to recompress. That's going to be YouTube and Instagram and Facebook and Vimeo. And Vimeo, I think today announced something like everybody's got to be at a different paid tier and a whole bunch of people are saying things like, well, that's going to be the end of Vimeo right there. And it, it might be, I don't know. Um, to answer your question, one, this here, and I'm going to make it bigger behind me, this is YouTube's file and formats. And they're very, very specific. You know, here are the sizes they want. Um, here are the formats they want. And, oh. This is the better, this is the better version of that. Here is the H264 that they want. Here are the couple rules about it. Here are the bitrate rules. And this is what they recommend as the bottom. Now, if you look at Adobe's settings for YouTube, their setting is 1080, <coughs> depending on the preset, 16 or 20 megabits per second. And they're ahead, they're going, we are exceeding what YouTube says by a factor of two. And the only reason these numbers exist as small numbers is so you're not there at your upload all day. Now, your group is in San Diego. You, in theory, should have some ability easily to get to uh, fiber for upload, a gigabit upload. I'm in the sticks. I'm not just on the East Coast. I'm a Philadelphian. I live in the middle of nowhere, Delaware. I'm generally the first person people meet from Delaware. Um, it's, a, it's true. We pay no taxes at the stores. Uh, you go to a store, you go to the Apple store, the number one Apple store in the country happens to be in the Christiana Mall. And the price you see on the shelf is what you pay for it. The negative is, as in many other places, it's got small population, a lot of people incorporated here. Best I could get. Uh, cause I can't get anywhere near fiber. I get about 40 megabits up. And if my file was encoded at 40 megabits per second, it'd be a one-to-one -one time. In other words, a minute of video, minute upload. If it was 20 megabits, it would be two minutes per minute. The bigger it is, the slower the upload. These are YouTube's suggested, suggested minimums. 
but they openly say you can go larger than this. And they have a second set of settings meant for, I want you to see this. Um, what do they say? This It's, oh, right here at the top, movie and TV partner help. This is what they give the studios. Hey, you're giving us HD content. These are the resolutions and frame rates. Here is ProRes HQ, H.264. And take a look, the same group that said to you, eight megabits is saying 60 megabits right here, 60. So what should we take away from this? You shouldn't upload damaged material. You can upload ProRes if you like, if it'll support it. But Jeff, what about Vimeo? Vimeo plays the game of, well, it's how much you upload. And suddenly uploading those ProRes files becomes really prohibitive and constant quality encoding becomes really sexy. But Facebook and all these groups really do a lot of damage to your work. By the way, Shutter Encoder can download web video. Why would you want to download web video? Well, if you upload something to YouTube and you pull it back down, you can see exactly what they compressed at. Why was that valuable? Because if you want to simulate how much damage they're going to do, you could take 30 seconds of your own footage, a minute, like we talked about with an in and out, do a two pass VBR compression of that. And this is the time where I'm saying two pass at that data rate. And you'll get a pretty good idea of how much damage YouTube or Facebook or Instagram is going to do to your video without you having to upload it to a test account. So the answer here concurrently is you can upload larger files. You can upload ProRes. Constant quality encoding guarantees the quality is gorgeous. If you've got gigabit ethernet, man, I would work in Premiere, I'd work ProRes, I'd burn drives without anybody's business, and I would just upload a ProRes file to YouTube. It gets more complicated, of course, when we talk about other places, but that's the real basic concept. How did I do there? Yeah, that was great. I just got fiber uh, gigabit up, gigabit down at my office here. And yeah, it's like... I'm, I've gig down. I've got gig down, but I don't have gig up. I have 40. It's, 40. A, it's amazing. Like the first couple of times you do it, because I was used, I had to upload, you know, like a 16 gigabyte file to Dropbox for somebody to download. And usually that would be like, okay, I'm going to go take a walk. I might go get something to eat, come back. It might be overnight. It could be, you know, it's like, you're not going to, that's not going to happen right away. That took just like a few minutes. I mean, it was just like insanely fast. How long, or how long it took. I, by the way, I apologize. I realized I wasn't screen sharing when I brought up web video. I want you to see that there's shutter encoders, web video download. And this is by the way, using a library that's open source called YTDL. YouTube download. Um, other groups use it. This guy actively maintains updating it. He's doing a phenomenal job of a GUI. And there are third-party groups that will sell you a FFmpeg GUI. But uh, this guy, Paul Pacifico in Shutter Encoder, he's a French guy. I've corresponded to him a bunch. He's just a great resource. He This software has been updated like 15 times in the last year. It's just phenomenal. Yeah, Frederico envies us. He's got 20 down and 10 up. Frederico, I hear you. And you already have Shutter Encoder, but this idea of constant quality encoding is just so powerful. Um, what else can I answer? Don't be shy. You can ask me wild ass questions about Premiere too. It's a slurry of information, Greenberg. Hey, could you put that up for us? Absolutely, I could. While we're sitting here, I'm going to take 10 seconds and I'm going to export this as a PDF. I'm going to put it onto my Dropbox. I'm going to put the link to it directly into the chat. If, if while people are still thinking of questions, I do have one other one. So yeah, it, it, I'm going to try to figure out how to phrase this because this is something I read a while ago and I'm trying to remember how to phrase it exactly. So in Premiere, 
there was a thread that went around or there was a paper that got a post that got written up uh, about how to get the best encodes out of Premiere. And one of the, or if I believe the comments were that the, the system that you had to do was in the encode settings, you had to click both maximum render quality and maximum bit depth to get, and then, but that wasn't enough. You had to go into the, this, I think the properties or the sequence properties or something like that. And there was two settings there that you had to click as well. Maximum bit depth, I think being one and I maybe maximum render quality. I don't forget what the other one is. If you didn't have all four of those checked, you're not going to get the best encode. You know, the, that that's the magic sort of little secret switch that makes things even better than, you know, whatever. And, and I don't know the the amount of quality difference that's really so good. I know who wrote it. I know who wrote that. Yeah, I think it's a you friend of mine. Did. Yeah, uh, he's a friend of mine. His name is Yarle Leopold. Yep, Yarle's. Uh, he does a bunch of presets. I've, uh, I'm, and I mean, I've known the guy for. It's got to be now a decade. Hold on, before we go any further. Oh, I just needed to copy the link. Here, I'm going to teach you guys something else crazy. Um, I'm going to put the link. Do not. Click on the link when I put it in. So I've put the link into the chat. I'm going to put the link in, but I'm going to change the very last part of the link. See where it says equal zero? It's a Dropbox link. I've made it equal one. If you have a Dropbox link, all Dropbox links are equal zero. If you make it equals one, it will automatically download the file. Instead of you going to the Dropbox page and then having to hit download, when you hit equals one, it directly downloads the, the file. So there's a bonus for you, not Premiere related, just good information. Um, yeah, so there's um, really two things that Yarlay's, Yar Yarlay is trying to bring light to, Eric. He's trying to bring light to when you work in a 10-bit or higher environment, and you're trying to do your rendering, it's crucial that you carry the data correctly. And that's what the sequence preset switches are. The, the, the um, maximum render quality, and I forget what the second one is. And they're on by default for export. At this point, we all should have a video card that does this, and these should be defaults, I wish. You know, the people at Adobe are wonderful. Um, developers always have the same exact problem in life. They've got to balance their core of users, solving bug problems, making sure they're keeping relevant features in front of the faces of users. It's a balance and it's a difficult balance. If I had my choice, I would ask you, hey, let me take a look at your machine before you start using Premiere. Oh, you've got a great video card. I'm going to change these defaults for you so you get a good experience. Oh, wow, man. You've got a nine-year-old CPU. I'm going to tell you, you really should watch this video about proxy footage because phew, your system's not going to work great. And do you, really want to, do you really want to be a software company telling somebody they got to buy new equipment? Yeah. Um, Yarlay's dug into this, and... I'm generally, generally sure when I hear something Yarlay's dug into, he's right about it. There are a couple of times where he and I have disagreed, but not, not a lot. So yeah, those are really good switches to use, but they're most crucial when you're talking 10-bit or greater material. Yeah. And some of us are using 10-bit, some of us aren't. Um, I'm actually a huge, huge fan when you're working log with Premiere of using the brand new, the last rev, of their color management, which requires a GPU uh, and throwing that switch because you get much smoother transforms of your material. I could get into a really deep, ugly talk about LUT workflows and what I think Resolve gets right with their color management. The other groups have less right. But if your clients walk away happy, who cares, right? Right. As long as your clients are happy at the end of the day and they want to pay your bills, who cares? Now, and that's that's good to know because, yeah, for, for me, the stuff, 90% of what I'm editing is stuff I've shot and it's all for my camera that's shooting 10-bit. So for me, flipping those switches is a good thing. But if I were you know, editing 8-bit footage, 
you know, that's, you know, H.264 or, or MP4, you know, whatever, and something less than that, then, yeah, there's no point. It sounds like there's no point in flipping those switches because you're just going to get a lot. Right, and they're off by default because they hurt rendering time, especially with underpowered GPUs. Now, Eric, I know you're running a PC. What what GPU are you running? So I have a HP Z8 G4. So with, you've got one of the Z workstations, yeah, yep. It's got a, it's got dual xenons. I think they're 3.2312 silver, but they can over lots of CPUs, silver. right? Yeah, I got 48 like with hyper threading. It's like 48, you know, cores or whatever. What's your GPU? So that I'm I'm rocking the original card that came in it, which I got four years ago, which was a Quadro. Quadro. Yeah, the Quadro 5000, I think. So I have to double check, but it's I know it's time to upgrade. There's a. Founders Edition 3070 card. Um, and the beauty of these cards, and the consumer cards do very, very well with it, is Premiere will use it to a degree. Resolve does even better with it. It's not about, you know, apples and oranges, pardon the pun there. Um, for me, I'm doing color-based work whether I'm teaching or working in Premiere or any other tool on my Windows box, I'm looking for a good GPU to be there. Same thing for my Mac boxes. I'm doing the same exact thing. I have yet to buy a Mac, an M1. I think what Apple's doing with the studio is very interesting. Like all of you here who stuck behind Zoom, I have to make this decision whether or not I'm living still in the laptop work style where I'm traveling out the clients or whether I'm predominantly going to be doing it from home and seeing my kids, because there is a certain, you if you bring me to your group virtually, you save about three $300 a day, because you don't have to put me up in a hotel, you don't have to feed me, you don't have to give me a car, you can have me teach your group in you know two hour, three hour segments in the morning, and you can still get a lot of work done. Or... We can tie everybody up and put them in a room together and we can bond and go out for beer that night and really get into the nitty gritty and have that sort of communal class activity. Both ways are super crazy valid. I'm invariably grabbing a laptop on those jobs. And up before the pandemic, it was all laptop based. Now we're post pandemic. The CPUs have gotten better. They're really interesting on the Apple side. It's really interesting to watch what the PC manufacturer. I'm about to switch to a Dell uh, I've got a 5560 workstation. I'm going to go to a 5570. I just got another box underneath here that may live here permanently. I'm definitely uh, putting in a SAN in the next couple of weeks in the office. I have about 70 terabytes with a T of directly connected storage, but I want to have a SAN for my uses. Um, it's a different world we live in than two, three years ago. The most important thing is that the horsepower you have does the job you need it to do in a timely manner. And the box you have does a great job with all of the Xeon two separate hard CPUs, the amount of RAM and the good GPU in it. Yep. Yeah. No, and I, I, I've got a, I, I've got a, so I've got the HP and I've got a Dell laptop as well. Workstation. It's an older 7710. I got it when the kids were born because I knew phenomenal box it's going to have to be here, but it's got Thunderbolt three. It's got 64 gigs of Ram. It's got a quadro 4,000 card. It's the thing that kept me off the 77 series versus the 57 series is it's only got two Thunderbolt ports and I need four. I need, <laughs> I'm, Right. And it's it's not because it's just because I've keep my storage on one and I'm running an eGPU on the other. Uh, yeah. um, right. And the reason the really geeky technical reason is two Thunderbolt ports share one Thunderbolt controller. And if you're running data against a, an eGPU, you're having the bandwidth. So sorry to take you down that path. So sorry. Does anybody want to talk about something interesting? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, any other questions? I've got one. Go ahead. Oh, uh, hear Andy. Edwards. Hi, Jeff. Uh, two Hi. quick questions. Back to your. By the way, Andy, have we met? Because I feel like you've yes, met you before, my friend. Premier World together back in the day in San Jose. And sorry to flaunt this, but I helped co write this uh, cool stuff with Yarle. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't, no, no. Like, again, again, we can grab a book of mine. We can grab some stuff. I know. Yarle no. and I are buddies. I 
I've loved congratulations. your congratulations. I've You're loved all kind. your talks. You've been fantastic for like every time I get to see you. It's always I have a copy. I have a digital copy of your book. Thank okay. you. All right. Um, back on the encoding side, two questions. How often do you change your presets due to Adobe changing the architecture under the bottom? I'm talking about uh, render wise because I've seen an issue with XDCAM 50 MXF stuff where we had it checked and you would just stall when you would queue into encoder is one, but we solved that problem. And the other is, do you use the normalize function in the effects tab for exports? You know, where they've got the uh, dial norm settings now, you can do minus 24. So um, I, I am a big fan of the um, essential sound panel. I'm using that for a pass. I'm, I'm using a hard limiter to make sure I'm never exceeding and I'll do a direct monitoring. There's a feature in um, Audition that lets you do a analysis pass of it to make sure you're not, that you're staying inside of the LKFS. That's the loudness, loudness normalization, right? I call it the LKFU meter <laughs> for okay. obvious reasons. Um, I don't use that switch. So let me okay. let me put it like this because I'm, I'm pretty fastidious about my audio. I'm pretty, pretty, make sure it's pretty tight. I also know that if online is going to be my end source and my normalization is off, YouTube will normalize it to where they want it to be anyway. Coming back to the XD and checking, I've never gone back and rebuilt settings. I'll every When I open them up, I'll check them, especially when I haven't done them in a while. And I write detailed notes. I, I should show you this because you'll have a good laugh. And this laugh is meant for you, just for you. Um, I'm going to go ahead here and just bring open Media Encoder. And when I go to my presets here, I'd like you to see, where are my presets? I'd like you just to see like how much, oh, I'm a little ashamed, there you go. Uh, VR 180, 4K proxies, DNXLB, proxy presets. This is 100% size match proxy, CBR 1.5, miscellaneous, uh, H264, CBR 5 megabits, HD size, stereo audio, 6519 Greenberg. That's how far I would typically go for a client for my encode presets. Now, having said all that, Andy, what I tend to do nowadays is I'm just kicking out ProRes and I'm giving it to FFmpeg or Shutter Encoder with the one caveat that if I encode to ProRes using FFmpeg, I'm technically building a non-compliant ProRes file. I would not give it to something like Netflix or any you know the big distributors, even if it would pass clearance. Um, I'll build it with a true Apple encoding, like out of out of Media Encoder. Was that a good answer for you? That was fantastic. Thank you. Okay. My pleasure, man. Hey, and uh, it's, it's, it's a, I'm, look, I'm, I'm honored to know Yarley. I'm honored to know you. Uh, who's uh, the third one, Paul? It's Paul and Dylan. Paul and Dylan. They're both yeah. phenomenal people. Next time you talk to them, don't hesitate to tell them how much I admire them. Oh, no, we, you, me, and Yarlo all had beers in San Jose, so we're all good. <laughs> I, I, we need to do it again. If you're in Vegas, I yeah, if you're it. in Vegas, I'm, my general rule, by the way, in Vegas is I'd buy first round. Oh, bless. And you then are. that's the last beer I have to buy that night, generally yep. speaking. <laughs> no, thanks. Andy, are you rocking uh, your Adobe Mac shirt? Uh, sort of. <laughs> That's how big an Adobe nerd I am because I got the same shirt. I kind of saw the top of it. So, yeah, all of my all of my shirts no longer fit. They're all too much too big. Except this. Yes, shirt. Jeff, your weight loss has been amazing. I hope that's. Uh, I mean, it's all for healthy reasons. Wild. Children. It's all wild. for healthy reasons, but it's that reason that uh, I am old enough that if I'm going to be there 10, 20 years from now, I better get leaner. Uh, this morning. Uh, uh, I, I was uh, 184, oh. uh, which is about uh, probably a solid 75 less than you saw me. That's fantastic. 
That's all good, good vibes. It is very good stuff. Uh, I've been holding it that for nearly for for nearly two years now. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and again, in Vegas, I'll be breaking a bunch of rules, but yeah, <laughs> it's okay. Larry, okay. David, we do, uh, we do Len, you're you're here. Yeah, ask. Oh, I, I, a client asked me to export with the audio peaking at minus 20 LKFS. I found no way to visualize in Premiere. Any idea? Um, Adobe used to have an LKFS meter. Uh, there's a great third party um, meter. I'm trying to think from who. I think it's, um, I think it might be Isotope gives away a free meter. Somebody's got a free LKFS meter out there. The only negative about LKFS metering is you got to play it back in real time, whether or not you like it. But I will tell everybody that one of the beautiful parts of the essential sound panel is it puts elements generally in the right spot for loudness metering, generally. Much better than I do just based on ear or reading a meter. And I use it as my first pass for nearly all of my audio because it's that good out of the gate. There are things that it sucks with, like, you know, if something, if it's a speaker and there's a lot of quiet to it, you know, and it's, but generally speaking, uh, Adobe's essential sound panel is one of those things that separates Adobe from the rest of the pack for people who've got weaker audio skills. And that would be me. Um, so it's all of us, man, we're all just on the path. If your um, clients are happy, who cares? So uh, any last questions before we let Jeff go? And I, I'm going to ask him one last little thing before, if nobody else has anything. So this is it. You got a last question. Now's the time. Go ahead and unmute yourself and feel free to ask. All right. Well, one last thing I just wanted to pick your brain about. So I don't know if you, you ever heard of this. There was a plug-in edition. Andy might, might have used this or heard about it because I think the guy was on the beta forums promoting it years ago. But there was a plugin you could buy for Premiere for, for encoding to H6 or H264. It was called like X264. I think that's right. So, so and it kind of went away. So I'll get, no, no. It, it, well, he probably ran into um, a GPL general public license issue. So, so we understand. H.264 is the codec. It is um, specifically an international telecommunications body numbering. That's what the H is for, stands for video and audio. 264 is the specific version of it. Um, it's part of the MPEG, the Motion Picture Expert Group, fourth revision set. Um, the encoder, though, isn't the file. The file is an H.264 file. The people who've been one of the major proponents of it, the people who sit on the board, one of the groups is called Main Concepts. And Adobe and a lot of other groups license the Main Concept encoder. There are a lot of these great people in the public domain and uh, out there who open source stuff who have reverse engineered it. One of the big contentions around H.264 for a couple of years was how they were going to handle the encoding licensing for independent users like us. And there have been some very, very popular, very powerful codecs that have very onerous costs for content creators and they tend to die on the vine. Well, this group did some reverse engineering and they built their own encoder. That's what the X stands for, X264. It's an external group, but it's maintained under the general public license, the GPL. And these licenses say you cannot charge for these parts and you have to, you, these libraries are not for you to sell and you have to abide by these rules. And it's why Shutter Encoder is donationware and not for charge. And there's a group out there that sells an FFmpeg encoder and they go, we're selling you the tool, but you've got to download FFmpeg and put the library here. You need to click and do this because we can't charge you for that part. So what this guy was doing, and he probably had it on AE scripts, he was selling an encoder. I'm assuming one of two things, Eric, he was selling an encoder and somebody along the lines flagged it and said, buddy, you can't do this. Or it just wasn't profitable enough for him to upkeep it. And, you know, and it's, it's why he went away. Vocoder on Windows gives you this full functionality that you just saw me do with Shutter Encoder, and it's F-R-E-E -E free. Yep, and I'll be downloading it tomorrow. 
<laughs> so all right Let's... and then uh, I'll, I'll i'll throw a plug in if you haven't seen it uh if you haven't seen excalibur from knights of the editing table it is like spotlight on the mac where you can hit a key my favorite use of it is that you can sit back and set a preset an effect to apply to a clip so you can select a clip you hit control space you type in the name of the effect that you want and it gets applied to the clip it is faster it is a very it's like 80 bucks it's incredible we actually demoed that last month um we did that watchtower and um you had do you had ivan here uh, no i did it i just um no oh. ivan ivan was nice enough to donate some giveaways though for it but yeah no it's i demoed phenomenal it. plug in yeah, i was using i'm doing I'm doing at NAB, by the way, a session on AI use, uh, and I'm talking practical tools. I'm not going to talk to you about machine language bullshit. Uh, there's one in Premiere. There's a AE script. I forget the name of it. I think it's, is it Blaze? No, it's not Blaze, but uh, it literally will find faces and blur faces for you automatically. In a Funny enough, we talked about that last month, too. So oh, nice. That's, yeah, we, it was last month's meeting was all AI stuff, and so... Uh, DJ, who was the co-manager, he showed Blaze and showed all of that stuff. I showed Excalibur and all the nights, you know, that stuff. And I showed a couple AI things in Premiere. But, which uh, one was your favorite? Uh, the which ones? The Blaze stuff? Of AI, the AI stuff. Oh, the 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 face uh, blurring. And I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna drop. I'm gonna do a mic drop moment. I really am. As we lost somebody, you ready? Go. Uh, it's called Dinoscore. D-Y-N-A-S-C-O-R-E. It's from wonder.inc. And so what you know what it does, um, it's, it's a third-party AI tool. It has some AI functionality. It lets you drop markers in a Premiere timeline, bring up the music tool. You pick a piece of music, and it then readjusts the music emphasis based on your markers. So it's like you are scoring this song directly to your edit. Wow. And Eric, you're going to bug me after this and I'll introduce you to, to the group because you're going to want to have them next month um, or two months from now, after, one month after NAB. So, okay, so Dino Score and it's wonder.inc? I believe it's wonder.inc. Okay, yeah. That's... There are other tools, but it's this one is incredible. With my only criticism of it is I wish their music libraries were deeper. Yeah. But the idea that you can go in and go, I'd like a pause here. I'd like a beat change here. Eight seconds later, a beat change there. And this is the wrap. And it's this many seconds. And it takes their baked music and it massages it to it and hatches it. It's pretty impressive. It, it reminds me of what Smart Sound used to do. Um, they used to have something. Right. Like that. Smart Sound, though, was using a whole bunch of loops and stuff. This is a right. little bit more intelligent. We got one question here from yep. Farah. Oh, Dean says, I enjoyed his first time here. Have to go. He, that's why he left. There's Dinosaur. Thank you, David. Um, Farah says, I exported ProRes and After Effects and used Handbrake to compress it to H264 to make it smaller. It loses a lot of quality, even with high setting and Handbrake. Um, you could be doing a lot of things wrong there, Farah, but the most obvious one that you could be doing is if, um, to give you an idea, I would tell you generic first. ProRes 4x4 and After Effects is only necessary if you're trying to carry an alpha channel. And since H.264 files cannot carry alpha channels, there is no real point of rendering ProRes 4x4. I could give you a slight argument over RGB color space over YUV. I'd probably go ProRes HQ, not 4x4. That being said, um, if I were going to do it in a handbrake, I'd use constant quality encoding. And if I really cared about its quality, I'd set it to about 18 or 17 in constant quality. If you want to do it data rate, data rate based, I probably would not encode in high def anything less than 80 megabits per second. Why 80 megabits, Jeff? So glad you asked. Um, GoPros, I forget what they call their higher bit rate, but they're pro, pro encoding Pro-tune. or something like that. Pro-tune. Pro-tune. ProTune and high def is 60 megabits, 60 megabits for this little stupid action camera. 
Uh, and there's some stuff that I get that can never encode smaller than that because there's so much data. So if I were going to use Handbrake and I were going to dial in a number, I think I'd for high def dial in at around 80 megabits. And if I were going to go for 4K information, I don't think I'd go four times, but I'd go like 150 or 160 megabits per second. And I would, of course, do an in and out test of a small section just to give you a feel, Farrah, just to give you a feel. And the reason I can bandy about those numbers is because I have a direct association with them. I would just skip all of it, go to constant quality, set it at 18 and see what you think of it. Makes life a lot easier, constant quality encoding. All right. And with that, there's not any last questions. We are going to let Jeff go so he can go to bed. Um, Jeff, that was everything and more that I wanted. I had told Jeff before we did this meeting that um, at the, for those of you who are regular members of the group, you know, at the end of every year, we always do, okay, what do you guys want to hear for next year? And literally encoding has been, it's come up on that list every year for the last five or six years. And we never found anybody to do it. We always find other stuff to, we would always find other stuff to talk about. And we would kind of briefly cover it. Never had anything that was this comprehensive. And Jeff, you just hit it out of the park, my friend. Thank you Thank so you. much. Dude, it's, it's totally my pleasure. If you want other stuff, I'm happy to recommend that to people. I'm happy to talk about other things. Um, I ran a user group for a decade. And I will tell you the reason user groups work are the people who run it. They're dedicated, they're volunteers, nine times out of 10. Um, and I'm only sorry that I'm not in San Diego and we couldn't go out for beers after this, my friend. Maybe yeah, in trust Vegas. Me. Yeah, well, at NAB, I'll definitely be getting you at least one beer there. And um, yes, and for those of you who are local, we are hopeful that we will be meeting in person again soon this, this year and we can do our usual after meeting beers like we normally do. So, all right. Real networking is the best networking. It, I, I hate to say it. It really is. I can't convince the kids of that nowadays. The younger folks just never want to come out. So, but anyway. All right. With that, we will sign off. We will see everybody next month. Jeff, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I owe you big time, my friend. And uh, totally my pleasure. Thank. Oh, I disappeared. Uh, <laughs> I need to do this. There you go. No, thank you. Uh, it's a great group. Uh, I, again, next next year next year in San Diego. all right sounds good all right Thank everybody you, we will see you all next month <laughs>